Now we're going to look at the radical halogenation reaction. We're going to start out very simple and look at how methane undergoes radical halogenation. So we are taking uh, methane, and I explicitly drew out one of the CH bonds, and we're reacting that with Cl2 as the halogen. And then this requires an energy source. We can either use heat, which I've represented by the delta symbol, or we can use light, which is H nu. This will undergo the radical halogenation and will replace the hydrogen with one of the chlorines. And then the other chlorine will just pair up with this hydrogen to form HCl as a byproduct. Radical reactions undergo three mechanistic steps. The first is an initiation, the second is a propagation, the third is a termination. And this is how radicals are formed, what happens with them, and then how they're terminated in the end. So we're going to look at each of these three steps. In the initiation step, this is homolytic cleavage of the weakest bond in the system. If we look up here at our starting materials, we have CH bonds in methane and the CL-CL bond in chlorine. Of those, the CL-CL bond is much weaker. Halogen bonds are weaker than CH bonds. So when you put energy into this system, it's the CL2 bond that is broken. So let's use heat for this. And when this is heated, this bond breaks in two, and we get two chlorine radicals. One really important thing that I want you to keep in mind as we talk about this is that don't think of all of the chlorine just immediately splitting into radicals. At any given time, only a few molecules actually break apart. The rest will still exist as chlorine. So there's a very, very low concentration of chlorine radical in the system. But what we do have is a radical that's formed that can now carry us through the rest of the reaction. The second part of the reaction is the propagation. This is kind of the key step of the reaction where the product is formed. So now that we have chlorine radicals in the system, what can happen is that a chlorine radical can bump into one of the molecules of methane. So here's methane. We have the Cl radical. And if those two come into contact, what will happen is this will abstract a hydrogen atom from methane. So think about the two electrons in this bond. And one electron will go and pair with the chlorine. And those will pair up and give us HCl. The other electron will go on to the methyl as a radical. Here's our methyl radical plus HCl. From here, now we have this methyl radical that's very reactive. And this is going to run into a molecule of Cl2. So remember, not all the Cl2 is broken apart. Most of the chlorine in the solution is still existing as Cl2. So once this comes into contact with the Cl2, we have the two electrons in the bond. One will pair with the methyl radical to give us chloromethane. The other will go into the chlorine to give us a chlorine radical. So in this propagation, we formed our product. But we also formed a chlorine radical. And what happens is as soon as this chlorine radical is formed, it can now go back up here and do a second round of propagation.
So this is kind of a cyclic uh, process where as soon as one molecule of products formed, we get a radical which can do this process again. Then we get another radical, it'll do the process again, and so forth and so forth until all of the methane gets converted into chloromethane. So this is really the key to the radical halogenation. These two steps show how we get the product. Now there is a third step, which is termination. And the termination really isn't anything productive, but it does show us how the radicals eventually get quenched. Any two radicals in this entire system can, at any given point, run into one another. If they do, those electrons will pair and quench the radicals. So for example, if we have two chlorine atoms that happen to get in close enough proximity that they pair up, what will happen is we'll just form Cl2. Or if you have two methyl radicals that happen to run into one another. If that happens, those will come together and get quenched to give us ethane. The third thing that can happen is a methyl radical and a chlorine radical could run into one another. If that happens, those will pair and give us a molecule of the desired product. But it's really, really important to know this isn't how you get significant amounts of product. The product is formed in this propagation. This is just one pathway that does lead to some product. You really don't want to think of the termination as a good thing because termination quenches radicals and it actually slows down the overall radical reaction. But in the end, if you have some remaining radicals floating around once you've formed all of your product, the termination is how they eventually get quenched. So far we've looked at the radical halogenation using chlorine, but how about the other halogens? So here I have the thermodynamics of the reaction, or the delta H of the reaction, showing just how exothermic or endothermic each particular halogen would be. So first, if you look at the chlorination, which is what we did, this has a negative delta H, and it's exothermic by 25 kcals per mole. So that's a pretty large value, um, but this does work and we do get product. But now let's go up here to the radical fluorination. It's exothermic, but look at the value, 103. That's a huge, huge number. This is essentially an uncontrollable reaction. So that's why we don't do radical fluorinations. The radical bromination is exothermic, not by as much as the chlorination, but it still has an exothermic value, so this one works. And then finally, if you look at the radical iodination, this value is not negative, it's positive. That means it's endothermic, and it really doesn't work. So the only two types of radical halogenations we're going to be doing are the chlorination and the bromination.